I'm David Landon, the Associate Director of the Andrew Fisk Memorial Center for Archaeological Research at UMass Boston. And we're here on Burial Hill, finishing up our 2021 season. We've come back to an area where we've been doing a lot of digging in the past. We're on week five right now. The last four weeks, kind of um, mapping out soil stains, collecting artifacts, scratching our heads at the edge of holes in the ground, and trying to actually kind of make some sense of how this kind of fits into our interpretation of the site that we found here on Burial Hill. Between 1620 and about 1676, this was actually known as Fort Hill. The original settlement was set out so that the uh, fort was at the very top of Burial Hill with a cannon emplacement that looked down towards the harbor, uh, mostly defending against enemy ships from other countries coming into the harbor. The houses stretched out down along the hill and down Leiden Street, and the entire community was encircled with kind of a, a palisade, a, a kind of a wooden stockade that went around. And where we've been digging here at the edge of Burial Hill, we're down this year on an area where we are on top of the palisade line. So we have both inside and outside areas of the settlement to explore. And inside the settlement, we have returned to the site of a house that was, um, by all indications, one of the very early houses constructed in the Plymouth Colony settlement. We continue to get interesting artifacts in this building that point not to just domestic uses of this structure, but also potentially some of the commercial uses of some of, of the structures associated with the Plymouth Colony. Just today, clearing the floor of the building, we actually have been finding some um, pottery. So you can see this is a, a piece of a very large vessel, glazed redware, unglazed on the outside, but glazed on the inside. So this is really a, not so much for decoration, but the glaze is really for utility. We're making this pot more, more waterproof and useful by glazing the inside. Another interesting artifact that's a good match for the pot as kind of a, a domestic artifact that's pointing to somebody kind of living in this building is this beautiful spoon, 17th century spoon. And you can see that the, the bowl of the spoon is actually looks a little bit asymmetrical. And this is because this spoon is actually worn from use. So one edge of this spoon is actually worn down from the motion of stirring this in an iron or, or earthenware vessel which has actually caused wear along the edge of the spoon. So the pattern on the wear of this actually suggests to us that it was a right-handed person stirring the pot. I always say we do this archaeology with both our heads and our hearts, and our heads love the scientific aspects of this, and our hearts really love when we can actually like see the people that we're working with and when we find a spoon like this and, and see someone stirring that pot with their right hand, it, it really is a great kind of humanistic moment for everybody involved. Every bit of soil that we remove from this site goes through fine mesh screens to try and make sure we don't miss any small artifacts. Now, I'm, I'm hopeful that no one on my crew would have missed this one, but this is a um, example of a coin weight uh, a little brass token that was um, cast and shaped to match the weight of a particular coin, which would allow a merchant or trader to weigh this on a scale um, with the coin to make sure that it wasn't counterfeit or it hadn't been clipped. We love our dated and marked artifacts, and this one is, is one of several artifacts that, that point to the early 17th century on this site. Um, this one is probably our earliest artifact so far, um, predating the Mayflower. Um, but we found a number of artifacts also in kind of the, the early 1600s up to about 1640. So we're pretty confident that we're in a, a structure that's um, dated somewhere between 1620 and 1650. We've worked to kind of define um, the feature 
that is the Palisade line for the settlement. And the Palisade line here kind of um, runs um, in mostly kind of in an east-west direction heading down the hill around the settlement where our house is dug into the hillside, is inside, and where I'm standing is outside the original settlement. And before we ever recognized the Palisade, we recognized differences in the nature of the archaeological site. We didn't know it was because it was inside and outside at the time, but we started to recognize um, from where I'm standing and stretching further to the north that the artifacts were predominantly Wampanoag artifacts with very small numbers of European artifacts mixed in. When we go inside the settlement, we kind of flip that, and it's mostly European artifacts with small numbers of Wampanoag artifacts mixed in. And so we recognize this difference in the overall profile of the artifact assemblage before we understood that that was being structured because there actually was a fence uh, dividing these areas of the site and separating the major kinds of uses of the site. And we've learned a lot about the nature of the Wampanoag use of the area outside of the Palisade. So there definitely were Wampanoag people who were coming to the settlement, um, camping in this area, you know, temporarily, coming to trade or to parlay, negotiate, see what's going on. Um, a variety of different reasons people would come here. Um, and this area immediately adjacent to the Palisade on the outside was clearly a very, uh, a, a well-used space by native people who were coming, uh, coming up onto this edge of Burial Hill.